tonight on The Goblin's Corner. Our Planner Series Part 2, The Beastlands. That's how we roll. 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 Welcome to the Goblins Corner. My name is Eric. And I'm Matt. And tonight we're doing our planner series part two, The Beastlands. That's right. One of the planes that you probably have heard of at some point in your D and D career, if you've been playing D and D for any length of time, and one that doesn't get a lot of love. I was going to say you only maybe have heard of it. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into a little bit of lore, talk a bit about the Beastland, some of the dangers inherent in the plane, and maybe give you a little bit of story options for the plane. Sure. But before we get to that, I got a question of the week, man. That's right. So I'm going to just make a random guess that it's going to be Beastlands related. It is, in fact. Excellent. What's the question of the week, Matt? Okay, so most of the people who have watched and or listened to us by now are aware that if Eric went into a fantasy world, Eric would be a wizard. Or a spell to power erudite scion. In third level. Yes. I mean, in third edition, yes. yes. Sure. But what animal would you want to be in the Beastlands? Now... Here's some caveats. Okay. Dire versions are acceptable, of Ooh, course. Dire versions are acceptable. Mm-hmm. Okay. Somatics will take into account your animal form. So thumbs aren't strictly needed for the purposes of this exercise. So I could be like a bird if I wanted to be. Sure. I'm not going to be, but I could be. I have two. Okay. Now, you might consider that I would go the way of the Komodo dragon. Okay given my love for Godzilla and such, but I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to choose a mammal this time. I would have actually guessed a dire water dragon. A dire water dragon would be delightful, but no, still not going to do it. I will choose a raccoon. Understood. Because they're fuzzy, mischievous, whimsical even, and they've got thumbs. thumbs. Most important part, I I can steal things with it. Now, I would also go for dire raccoon, which is even more horrid and and even more delightful, because it's a medium-sized creature instead of a small or tiny. Or we could take a dip in the Wayback Machine, and you'd be a dire racadger. A racadger? Yes. <laughs> Is this a badger and a raccoon together? Yes, indeed. I love that as well. <laughs> and you know what I miss out of uh, third edition was the horrid forms as well? Yeah. A horrid raccoon? Yep. That would be delightful as well. Uh, my second would be much more ridiculous and equally fun to play, which would be a dire platypus. Okay, yeah, I can so see Imagine that. this large, fat platypus. I mean, it's perfect. Yeah, man, a platomancer? A platomancer, yes. I would be able to stand up on my flappy feet, mm-hmm. wave my front paws, which are poison-tipped. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> a little poison do claw action, yeah. yeah. Clack, my, clack my little beak and cast away. Then he got hit by a fireball by a giant... Platomancer. Yep. Those are my two answers. Either of them would be delightful for me. All right. I can see that. Mm -hmm. For me, there's the expected answer for most people who know me, which would be bear. Yes, I would expect that. But that's that's too easy. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's definitely not where we're going. No. I also have two. Okay. One would be a dire old world chameleon. A dire chameleon. Yes. I love that. So very large chameleon. I can see your eyes moving in different directions. Mm -hmm. Delightful. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thumbs. Oh, yeah. They got thumbs. Because much like yourself, I I have roguish tendencies. Yes. Even as a cleric. It's true. It just bees that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that would be my primary answer. What would be your secondary answer? Well, see... The beast land applies to all natural animals. Yes. Ankylosaur. Ankylosaur. Of course. Team Ankylosaurus. <laughs> That's right. Hashtag Team Ankylosaurus. Yes. Yeah. I could see that. Now, the truth of the matter is we'd both come back as cats. Most likely, yeah. 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 That's just how it is. Yeah. Do you have roguish tendencies or perhaps you're a cat? Write to us. Info at goblinscorner.com or you can reach me, eric at goblinscorner.com or... Me, Matt at GoblinsCorner.com. And of course, you can find us on all the things. So many things. Yep, Twitter mostly. Mostly. All right, 
Let's talk a little bit about the Beastlands, because that's the episode this evening that we're talking about. First of the matter, what are we talking about when we talk about the Beastlands, and why are we talking about the Beastlands, Matt? Firstly, we're talking about the Beastlands because they're not talked about. Right? They are super unrepresented, they're seldom used, and they're really neat. Yeah, the first rule of Beastlands is don't talk about the Beastlands. The <laughs> second like rule it. of Beastlands is don't talk about Beastlands. No, you never hear about it. There's a lot of different planes that you don't hear a lot about. It's true. Yeah, you hear a lot about all the other planes, but the Beastlands gets no love. You, you hear more about Arborea, right. where the elves come from. You hear more about, of course, Mechanus and Limbo, where the lovely Slod Lord <laughs> resides with a water balloon and a chainsaw. A giant mallet. A, well, there's always a giant mallet somewhere within easy reach, of course. Right next to the remote. Sure. But Beastlands doesn't get a lot of love. And so that's one of the reasons why we're tackling it. Secondly, it has some really interesting effects and a lot of really interesting locations. Yes. Like super cool stuff. Yeah. And it's filled with life and is inherently dangerous. Yes. Unlike, say, the Shadowlands, which is filled with undeath and it's dangerous, right? It's not a place that at first glance seems like it should be dangerous. It's one of the heavens. Mm-hmm. But you're going to get killed if you're in the Beastlands. I'm just saying. So. Heaven help you if you're a poacher. That would be so great. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, it can make an incredible story. Absolutely. It, it, stories in the Beastlands could be epic in nature and just really interesting to mess with. And it makes, to me, it makes an amazing side quest location oh yeah so as we're doing this tour of the planes no time like the present right yep in that case let's jump into the beastlands matt what are the beastlands they are one of the outer planes that is in between neutral and chaotic good okay so it's kind of like the plane that connects those two planes not quite chaotic not quite neutral but basically good. Right. And in some areas, it even kind of goes more neutral than good, depending mm-hmm. on how you look at it and how you run your campaign. You could easily have this as a true neutral plane as well. Sure. Just the, the way it's set up and structured, it would be perfect for that. But for most lore, it's neutral good mm-hmm. or in between, like you said. It is often called the three-layered heaven. For people, and uh, it's mostly for those who would rather live in harmony with nature, such as druids or rangers or all the naturey type folk. Yeah, each layer represents a different time of day. Mm-hmm. You've got Krigala, which is noon. Yep. You've got Brux, which is twilight, and that's either sunset or sunrise. Yeah. And Karasuthra, which is ever night. Yeah. Which is really awesome because, and we'll get to this in a bit, but there are portals throughout all three planes to each other. Mm -hmm. So you could literally be running around being chased by a cheetah. You duck under a tree and now you're in Karasuthra and you're in the middle of the night. Now you're being chased by jaguars and you (laughs) dive in, you know know what I mean? Like you dive around a corner and now you're in Brux and you're being chased by a a gibbon ape or something like that, you know? Or you fall into an ocean and there's a shark because that's when they hunt is at twilights. That's very true. Yeah. Very true. Uh, different terrains can exist right beside each other with no need for any logical progression. Yes. You could turn the corner and be in the middle of the ocean. Yes. You could literally go over a sand dune, trip and fall into a rainforest. Yes. Or a tundra. Yeah. You're running from the polar bear and all of a sudden you're in the middle of the desert. Then all you got to do is keep running for a little while. He's going to die of heat exhaustion before you do. <laughs> so, so what we're saying is, is it is a place of great change. Mm-hmm. It is a place of great wilderness. And it is a great place for beasts of all sorts. Sure. It's like it's its job. Now, much like in our previous planner series, we're going to give you a couple of challenges, some 
cultures and maybe some story options as well. Let's let's talk a little bit about the unique challenges with being in the beast lands. First off, how do we get there? You've got a couple options, right? You can get there through a portal. Now, whether or not that's a, a permanent portal, a gate, a color pool, what have you, right? An accidental mishap in the lab laboratory. <laughs> sure. A wizard spell. Mm -hmm. Or you can die. Or you can die. Yeah, just right? Drop it dead. Is, it's a heaven. That's true. Yeah. And if you're a ranger or a druid, you might end up in the beast lands just by dying. Yep. Easy to get there. Of course, getting back might be a bit of a problem. You're going to have to have an Orpheus situation with your friends coming to get you. Yeah, that's, that's true. You can also get there via Oceanus, mm -hmm. which is the river that flows through all the heavens. Yeah. Yggdrasil. Mm -hmm. Which is the world tree, which touches all planes. There's potentially portals from Elysium, Arborea, uh, color pools, we mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So it's from the astral plane as well. And of course, there's no doubt some portals and other places from other planes as well that you can tinker into your game. So for example, the infinite staircase might be a good place to throw a, uh, throw a portal to the beast lands. Right. And you and I both tend to any place that strongly and directly reflects something on the prime material plane, there's a chance that there is a portal that appears statically or occasionally into whatever plane it represents. Absolutely. Because really the portals are just mechanisms to get your characters into the plane anyway. So tailor it according to your story. Yep. Now, once you get there, there are potentially a host of various ridiculous terrain stacked on top of each other. Depending upon where you end up in the plane, you could be in a jungle, you could be in a forest, the taiga, which we alluded to in a previous episode. Yeah. Right there. And any po anywhere else name in between. Yeah, yeah. Name just, name the place. If it's naturally occurring, it probably exists. Could end up on an atoll. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. It'd be, wouldn't it be awesome to show up and just like end up in a vacation spot and you're like, you know what? I'm going to just take a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just get hunted by the Galapagos tortoises because everything's <laughs> hunting you. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be kind of interesting. Be slow death. They just slowly come after you. Now, one thing to note is if you're traveling through the beast lands by Oceanus, mm -hmm. you might have some problems. So what I'd like you to picture is a whitewater rafting trip. Yes. Travel along boat by Oceanus is treacherous. Yes. Prepare for rapids, rocks. Your boat's going to sink, basically, unless it's magical or flies. Right. Speaking of flying in the beast lands, traveling tends to be somewhat precarious flying in the beast lands. Indeed. There are faces, literally, in the clouds. They are known as the Morti. They control all of the weather. In the beast lands. Yeah, full stop, all the weather, yeah. which means, sorry, druids, you can't control the weather. Yeah. You, can't, you can't control weather, you can't control winds, none of that. No spells, like, it just doesn't work. Yep. Uh, and in previous editions, these creatures had the ability to cancel fly spells as well, so it forced anybody that didn't have wings to basically hot-foot it to the yep. next place. And... I would say that if I were running the beast lands, why not keep people from flying? No, 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 no. Here's here's my methodology here. What? I, I like that idea. Rocks? The big giant birds? No, no. Only when you reach a certain height. Oh, like after five feet? No, like say you the second you break the cam canopy or the second you fly above any vegetation. Oh, it just turns off and you yeah, just feather fall? fall. <laughs> Because that's what happens when flight is canceled. Mm -hmm. It feather falls. The second you break the edge of where terrestrial things should be able to hunt you. Nice. Right? Because if that cat's chasing you, it can j climb trees too. Yeah. So flying through the trees, that's perfectly fine. The second you break the canopy and the cat's not allowed to chase you anymore. Nah, man. You don't get that. You got to deal with that cat. Yeah, I love that. Now, for storytellers, the questions you need to ask yourself are, first off, how do your characters travel? How are they going to get from place to place? 
consider the time it takes to travel in the beast lands, right. the distance that's required, and all of the various factors. Because part of the fun of running a beast lands adventure is a you could literally wind up in one of the different planes, the sub levels, or b the terrain is vastly different. I mean, you could literally every five minutes roll a table, and it's now you're in the tundra. You yeah. know how that's awesome. Yeah. You've been traveling for two hours through the dense rainforest. Clatter, 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 clatter. You break into an open glade where it is snowing fiercely. Yep. And that's how it works. Yep. Which means you are not prepared for the terrain. No. Straight up. Speaking of the terrain, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, as you mentioned, literally any terrain could be over the next hill. Most descriptions imply that it is heavy wilderness. Like what? So, savanna. Mm -hmm. And if it's savanna, you're talking like full. Like face high grass. Yeah. Yeah. Cornfields even. Yeah. Something that the, uh, something that the tigers can appear out of. Any tall type of grass. (laughs) Instantaneously. Tigers or monsters or whatnot. Uh, Jungle is another one I see a lot or forests. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the descriptions I read, which I thought was very interesting, was a desert forest of cacti. Hmm. I could see that. Just nothing but cacti everywhere. Yep. Snakes. More densely populated than usual. That would be cool. Yeah. Tumbleweeds. You imagine like a forest full of tumbleweeds rolling around. That'd be kind of cool too. Now, we encourage savvy DMs to try other different terrain types, such as the ocean. We mentioned that earlier. It's splash. Oops. <laughs> you're, you're in a reef. Oh, cool. Or you're in the abyss. The, like the, what is it? The abyss of the, of the, like the Marianas Trench or something like yeah. that? That'd be kind of fun. You could be in the tundra. Yep. Desert. We mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Mountain ranges. Now, uh, Kragala has alpine slopes as part of it. And I would definitely say, yeah, at any point in time, you turn, you take a ra- wrong turn, and you're overlooking a cliff. So think of like Badlands or the Hoodoo's or stuff like that. Yep. If you're playing a modern campaign, the urban jungle. The urban. Oh, welcome the to the jungle. Concrete jungle. jungle you're my in man. the jungle, baby. Yep. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Can you imagine the rats just? Yes, I could. <laughs> yeah. So urban would be a great thing to explore. Yep. Now, I would definitely, because there are very few settlements and things like that, I would definitely keep that to a more modern campaign. Right. But it would also be kind of interesting to have that in the settlements in the Beastlands. So it just naturally turns into like an urban wilderness. Or as a domain. A domain for like an urban god. Yeah. Hell yeah. The Rat Lord. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely how I would do that. We're doing that. Yeah. That's going to be next up. All right. <laughs> So anything can happen in the Beastlands. Let's talk a little bit about the weather, speaking of anything, because you mentioned that the Mortai literally control the weather. Yep. If they feel like uh, they want a breeze, then they make a breeze. Now, it's predominantly natural weather, if I recall. It is. But doesn't mean you have to have that. It could, I mean, hurricanes are natural. Right. Dust devils, tornadoes, volcanic eruptions are natural. And speaking of terrain, you could totally have life on a volcanic mountain. Yes. The Hawaiian Mountains, for example. Yep. Weather encompasses an awful lot. Yes. From the most beautiful picnic day to, oh my God, the world is ending. Let's see the start of the next ice age, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be. Fire tornadoes. Fire tornadoes, folks. Yep. Have you ever seen the blood red lightning storms that some volcanic eruptions cause? Beautiful. Destructive. (laughs) There goes your part. Now, one of the things we should mention is there are three levels on this plane. One which is high noon, one which is constantly at sunrise or sunset, and one which is constantly at night, which means... There are no day or night cycles on the plane. Yes. Which means you are stuck at whatever time of day it is until you change layers. Now, 
this could, and I would say should, if you're a DM, especially a mean one like me, mess with your character's sleep cycles. Yep. Unless they're underdark. Because if they're underdark, then they would already have that natural rhythm if they were in uh, Karasutra. Or if they have Keen Mind. Keen Mind, yeah. Which allows them to keep track of the time at all times. Very true. So something to think about. Yeah. That's all you get. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Finally, we bring the natural dangers of the plane. Which is like the whole plane. It's, it's <laughs> an entire plane full of animals. Right. Animals and nature. Which okay. is all out to kill you. So we're going to start off with the fact that other than a very few humanoid instances, almost all of the inhabitants are animals. Mm -hmm. All of them are intelligent. And that is something to consider from the squirrel to the biggest cat there is to Ankylosaurus. Yes. And when I say intelligent, I don't mean intelligence of four. I mean these creatures have humanoid intelligence. Because they were once living creatures that got turned into animals. But even natural animals that come through the portals immediately gain that intelligence too. And this is a very interesting point because any natural animal brought through becomes intelligent. So pets, mounts, animal companions, whatever you have in your game suddenly decides to run off from you yeah. and think on its own. It needs some time to think about what's going on here. Now imagine your ranger tromping into the beastlands. He's got his trusty animal companion next to him. It's a wolf, right? The wolf turns and looks at him and goes, see you the later and trots off into the wilderness i got some to think about man i've been dealing with some things <laughs> yeah look man i gotta sort through some things I'll, I'll be back in a few comes back later now if you've treated them nice yeah no problems how many of you i there are two camps here i guarantee it take care of their mounts properly mm -hmm. now if you're the paladin you might because paladins and horses, like that's that's a that's a big deal. Yeah, but their mounts are magical anyway. That's so true. It yeah. Matter. yeah, they're not natural creatures, so actually their mounts don't. I mean, they are natural creatures, so their mounts don't gain super intelligence and run off. Hmm. Okay. They're the only pe people that get to keep their ride. Oh, good for the paladin. <laughs> for everybody else, expect your animal companions and whatnot to show up shortly thereafter and hunt you down if you're a d to them. Yeah, if you have been an unkind person, then it's going to be a bad day. Yeah. I will point out, under 5th edition, mm -hmm. now this doesn't apply to former editions, but under 5th edition, familiars are not actual animals. They are minor spirits in animal form. So it wouldn't apply to them, but if you're playing any edition before fifth then they're out of luck then your familiar is also going to split very true another danger of this plane is the plane itself and what we mean by that is is as we mentioned first off it turns normal animals into intelligent hunting animals mm -hmm. but also this plane creates a hunger to eat a yearning to hunt and this need to become more kind of bestial in nature you start growing fur or you might grow a beak, basically start turning more animalistic in nature. Yeah. And depending upon the version you play in, you might turn into an animal yeah. over time. And depending on the version you play in, when you leave, you may shed those changes. Or you may or not. you may not. Yeah, you may just have like a big you old You may beak. become a plane touched. That's very true. So something fun to think about. The way I would run that honestly is, do you want to keep it or not? Yeah. That's how I'd run it. Because that's for flavor. Yeah. Flavor. So think about that. Also, imagine trotting on an ant and it yells at you. <laughs> that would really suck. You know, boy, you must have done something terrible in life to be the dung beetle. Think about it. <laughs> Fine. All right. Lastly, we have surviving in this plane. So we've got all these natural dangers. We've got the weather. We've got animals that 
are out to kill you and their intelligence. They can do tactics. Yeah. You're turning into an animal slowly, ever so slowly. What else? How can you survive in this plane, Matt? So I'm going to give you another down point. Okay. <laughs> for surviving in this plane. It's in the middle of the woods. Yes. Settlements are very, very rare. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to hunt and or forage for your food in the same environment that hyper-intelligent predators are hunting. are hunting for food. It's a bad day. You're hunting down that rabbit for dinner and it's pleading with you? <laughs> Please don't yeah. kill me. How do you, what do you do with that? How do you square that? Yeah. That, because you know that it was once a person or humanoid of some sort that died and now it's the petitioner. Right. Might or, be fine. Or even if it wasn't, right? Let's say it was a normal rabbit. It's not anymore. Yeah, because it's intelligent now. Yeah. So now you're murdering and eating an intelligent creature. Yep. Like the octopus. <laughs> They're still delicious, by the way. One interesting point of note also is about setting a fire. On the first two planes, you're fairly good. Yeah, all right. But I would also say that there might be some fire suppression on the first two planes if you're playing the way I would play, because the plane actively doesn't want to get burned down. Well, there's that, but also I would play the Mortai as kind of mercurial. Oh, and they just rain on your fire? And like, maybe they're going to let it happen. Maybe they're going to give you a beautiful starlit night, but maybe you're going to get a tiny rainstorm that's just going to rain out your fire. Just to mess with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're definitely seeing. Or you could do it even worse and have a giant rainstorm that's all the way around the, like literally the only thing that's not getting rained on is the fire. (laughs) That'd be awesome. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about the bottom layer Karasutra. So first off, light is sparse there because it's, it's, it's night. night. Yeah. And trying to light a fire on that part of the plane is impossible. Yes. There's only two ways to produce fire or light on that plane. The first is to have a torch or some kind of fire and bring it with you. Yes. Means you have to have it burning already. Yes. And I might add, that doesn't mean you have it in your lantern and then start lighting a fire. No. No, no. You have to have the fire with you. Yes. And it will only burn what you got with you. Unless you can shove a fire, like a full-blown fire, into a bag of holding, or maybe a portable hole, folks. Think about that. Yeah. Then you don't have a chance. Uh, the other way is to cast some kind of light. So like the light spell or whatnot. But, e- but both of those are still very feeble light. They only shed half as much light. Much like the Plane of Shadows. Yes. I would... How do you square something like Create Bonfire? I would say it doesn't work. Or... Because it's a... It's a natural bonfire that is summoned magically. Yes. Actually, you know what? I think what I'd do is I'd check to see if it's a conjuration cantrip, I'd allow it because you're summoning it from elsewhere. That's that's fair. If it's anything but conjuration, then it absolutely not. It would still only shed half as much light. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about food. Food's abundant. Man, there are animals everywhere. Yeah. It's- <laughs> They're hunting you down too. Even the rabbits. <laughs> The squirrels all have tiny rocks that they drop on top of you, hopefully to pierce your skull. So that is something that I would very much like to discuss with our audience real quick. I would like you to check out exactly how many animals that you think are herbivores are actually opportunistic omnivores. Squirrels are omnivores. Deer. Yes and no. Yeah. But some of them definitely are. Mm Mm-hmm. So keep in mind, just because it's normally considered cute and fluffy, that rabbits will eat their own young. Oh, yeah. So do hamsters. Yeah. I learned that as a kid. Natural shelter also can exist, at least, in this plane. It's not, you know, harsh as, as harsh as you think. Right. 
I mean, if you don't like it, walk a, walk a mile, you'll be in a different terrain. <laughs> sure. But again, the animals aren't dumb. And it must be noted that if you dig a foxhole to hunker down, they're just going to crawl in there and eat you too. Everything is actively hunting everything else. And if you find a cave, it's probably occupied. Guaranteed there's a cave bear or something that's ready to just tear out your guts. Or something that's tiny that will happily wait for you to fall asleep. That's right. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about the denizens of this plane, but we'll be right back. After these messages. If there are any topics you would like us to cover, goods or services you would like us to review, or if you would like to sponsor an episode, we would love for you to contact us at info at goblinscorner.com. See you there. And we're back. Welcome back. So we're talking Planner Series Part 2, The Beastlands. Indeed. And we were going into the natural dangers and terrain and getting to the Beastlands and all of the horrible things that intelligent animals such as squirrels or ravens or whatnot could potentially do to you. And I think this is a good segue to jump into the unique different types of creatures and animals in the Beastlands. Sure. Now, clearly, the Beastlands are home to what, Matt? Beasts, perhaps? Beasts, one would say. Animals of all sorts. What kind of animals are we talking about here? So we start off with all natural and giant versions of natural creatures. Okay, that's very important to note, the giant part. Yes. Because I'm assuming that also includes dire? Yes. Does in my world. Okay. It doesn't good. specify one way or the other, oh, but well, I'm saying the dire saber to, saber-humped camel is, is there. The dire whale will, will find, the intelligent dire dolphin will find you and hump you to death. The dire ankylosaur. Dire ankylosaur, yes. I don't even know how that looks. It just it, has it's more even spikes. even more armor <laughs> yeah. and teeth. It's got teeth. That's sure. Big, that's why. As we mentioned, all the natural creatures are as intelligent as humans, and you may find various types of magic-using types amongst the animals. Yes. Or classes. Yeah. I mean, it goes without saying that most of them were once druids or rangers, so I would say that a couple of them might retain druid or ranger abilities, even though they're petitioners. Now that could be true, but let's also, let's, let's take a dip into a couple of other options real quick. Okay. The Oath of the Ancients Paladin mm. could very well find themselves here. Phalok? A Phalok, sure. The, it specifically mentions that the Seelie Court occasionally does roam through here. But also, you have, which we'll get into in a little bit, you have deities that you wouldn't normally expect to find here that make their homes here. I would expect every cat that crosses over to suddenly have wizard abilities. That's where the legend of the Sorcerer's Apprentice cat comes from. The familiar? And see, I would... Beastlands. That's where it comes from in my game. I would expect them to have cleric abilities. Cleric abilities for the cat? That's why they've always been holy creatures. Hmm. They can see the spirits and disturb the undead. That would be cool. But they always think they're gods anyway, so... What are they, cler the clerics of themselves? Yeah, they're, they're clerics of ideals. That makes sense. Now, it should be noted, since there are three layers to the Beastlands, there are three different sets of creatures, typically on each layer. So first off, Kragala, creatures of the day. Sure. So you're looking at all the birds, great cats, like the hunting cats, fish, herd animals, anything that's roaming around in the daytime, yeah. right? Diurnal critters. Dogs. Yeah, dogs would be good too, yeah. Then you have brooks, so those are creatures of sunset or sunrise, twilight, mm -hmm. and all of the creatures that come with that. Uh, monkeys, yep. Any any of the primates typically are twilight creatures. Yeah. Still birds. Mm -hmm. Fox. Yep. Mice. Bears. Bears. Some insects. Sharks. Sharks. Lots of types of fish, actually, and that's the reason why sharks are is because other fish are. Yeah, sure. Sharks are active pretty much any time. And finally, Karasuthra, which is night creatures. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the hunting owls, the coyotes. Jaguars. Oh, yeah, jaguars. Some snakes. Possums. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, raccoons. Lot, yeah. I was going to say a lot of your, uh, your pouch having friends will be active at night as well. That's very true. Yeah. So when you're building this out and you're describing the scenery in the various realms, be sure to include some of those animals in there. Now, nothing to say that these natural intelligent animals don't wander into a different realm. I mean, if I was a hunting creature and I know that I can literally step out of the shade and go hunt something down in the daylight, I would. Or vice versa. Take your Komodo dragon for an, okay. for an instance, yeah. right? We'll call him Bill. Bill the Komodo dragon. All right. So Bill knows that his body is far more responsive when he's warm. Bill would naturally be in the daytime. Not just that, but if Bill knows directly over that hill is a desert. Bill's going to chill in the desert, get all warmed up. Yep, get all basked up, and then turn around and charge at 30 miles an hour the nearest thing. Mm-hmm. Very true. In addition to the natural creatures in some specific parts of the Beastlands, you have Matt's favorite creatures, dinosaurs. And mine, by the way. Yeah. Team Tyrannosaur here, but Matt, of course, is Team Ankylosaurus. I thought you were Team Velociraptor. Velociraptor is you know, okay. any type of raptors, really. It's, it's my thing. Team Little Arm. That's yes. You. Team Team Tiny Arm. <laughs> Big teeth. One of the things you also get is Dumbos. Yeah. Uh, there's a creature called a Holly Font. Is that the elephants with wings? Yes. The tiny ones? Oh, they're not tiny. They are <laughs> elephant sized. Oh. I thought they were small. No. See, the picture looks cute, and it's misleading. It's an adorable little elephant picture. However, it is elephant-sized with gold, woolly mammoth fur, and golden wings. Boy, try not to stand underneath that thing. Right. Yeah. You also have various angels, as we've we've mentioned, because this is a heaven. Yeah. So yeah, there's going to be so large or divas, uh, the whole span of angels you can find here. Yep. We mentioned the Mortai. Yep. Uh, what else do we have? You've got the Agathians, and they are divine messengers and warriors. And they're, they look like slightly beefier elves hmm. with pearlescent skin and glowing eyes. <laughs> so they're so they're all I can see is a bunch of buff elves. They kind of look like Jersey Shore elves in my head, right? But the problem is, is they're shape changers, and when they're not in their native realm, they look like literally everything else. I to the see that. to the point of like inanimate objects and. Oh, so now the tree trunks are pissing you off because they're talking smart Alec at you and then you, you thump the tree trunk and it turns into this buff elf. I mean, how how embarrassing would that be to get your ass kicked by a buff elf? That has clerical powers and they are divine warriors. Yeah, oh, <laughs> they, there's that too. Yeah. Uh, speaking of other creatures, we have magical beasts of all sorts. So unicorns, centaurs, satyrs, all the fae and stuff like that could float around. And it should be said that most magical beasts are not native to here. Very specific ones are. The ones ones that are what I would consider super natural, Mm -hmm. right? Like extra natural. Like not necessarily a a behir that spits lightning and all that stuff. But a pegasus would be perfectly acceptable. Sure. I would definitely let that slide. Uh, You could potentially have treants. Sure. Or shambling mounds of the types of plant creatures. Sure. You might as, I mean, I know it's called the beast lands, but you might as well throw some violent plants into the mix. Yeah, why not, man? Some, was it the strangling vine? The intelli, what are they called? The creepers? Yeah. Strangling vines. Strangling yeah. vines, yeah. Uh, I would throw some myconids in there just for the hell of it. Some, oh my gosh. The, uh, what's the plant that turns people into zombies? The yellow musk? Yeah. Yellow musk creeper? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Throw why some not? of that yeah, in there. Throw some of that stuff in and I would also say land sharks. Yeah. I, they I would mean, find, nature finds a way. But the thing is, is like, they're fine, right? They're, they're not, once again, it's not going to shoot acid or lightning or anything like that. It's literally just something that burrows and eats. It's a giant mole with really good PR. But it would be intelligent. Yes. So there is that. 
So would the giant mole. Oh my God. Yes, it would. Boy, that'd be, <laughs> be horrible to consider. Big old mole. <laughs> Uh, let's talk a little bit about the unique type of cultures that you might have in the beast lands. First off, are there any cultures? Kind of. So first we have to say, theoretically, no, there aren't. Because there are so few settlements and most of the people that are left are either individuals or s groups that are so small that they don't really develop a culture. It's mostly just people living in harmony with nature in various ways. Now, now that being said, the biggest culture we could speak of, quote unquote, would definitely be the animals themselves, which are the petitioners. Right. Spirits of the people that passed on. And that you could divide into species. Maybe all of the rabbits speak as one tribe or all of the deer which are running in a herd. It doesn't have to be. Right. But that might be kind of something fun to consider. There's also some planar types of groups that do reside in the Beastlands. You've got the Sign of One mm -hmm. or the Signers. Yep. You've got a group called the Verdant Guild, and mm -hmm. these are wardens of the Beastlands. They protect the Beastlands from extra you know, like demons and devils and so forth. And poachers. Yeah, and poachers probably. You've got the Vile Hunt. Which kills petitioners, since they can speak. Yeah, so they deem any talking animal to be an aberration, and they try to kill it. Um, there's also, as you mentioned, multiple deities that make their domains in the beast lands. What are some of those deities, Matt? You've got Denier, who has the library of all knowledge on Brux. That domain... Yes, it's it's in the beast lands, right? But that domain is definitely going to have its own culture. It's going to have its own laws and do's and don'ts and all of that, right? So that's what I was saying when I said, yeah, there's kind of culture, but there's kind of not. It's in very specific spots. You just wander through the woods and all of a sudden there's a library. Yep. Just chilling. <laughs> yeah. Wherever the hell it is. You've got a Quarlin's Filch Nest. Quarlin is the god of Kinku. Okay. That's interesting. And Filch Nest, I mean. Yeah, that's that makes perfect self, sense. <laughs> Self-explanatory. And that's in Kragala. Mm-hmm. You've got Relevar Danovin. I'm pretty sure I said that wrong. It's Elvin. You know how Elvin names are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it could be anything. And he's the Frost Sprite King of the Seldarine. Yep. And... His realm is named the Ice Plane on Karasuthra. Nice. There's all kinds of powerful creatures as well, as we mentioned, the angels and various not. But there's also the Beast Lords. And I would almost say Lords of like the Hunt, which I think the Beast Lords are very similar to. Kind of powerful. In uh, a less fey way, yeah. Yeah, in a very, in, yeah, kind of a more like a natural way, but less fey. But still kind of like the Wild Hunt, essentially. Yeah. Now, the Domains for the deities can be closed or open depending upon the whim of those deities. Correct. And it also is dependent on the individual. Yeah. Right. If you're a wizard and they don't like wizards and I'm a cleric and they're fine with clerics, I'll be able to see it and you won't. And you could literally be standing in a city and not see it. Yep. Now, just because there aren't that many cultures in the Beastlands doesn't mean you can't have them in your game. So here's a couple options to think about. First off, tree-dwelling societies. Sure. You get a little, little Robin Hood action there? Yeah. That's the fun stuff. Savannah cultures? Yeah. Think of a city of Hattuzi. The Deck Apes? Yeah, I love them. That would I be awesome. Them. Maybe that's where they come from. Could be. Could be a bunch of apes that got smart through wings. Frog people? Of various types, so they could be gripply, yeah. and should be gripply. They absolutely should be dri gripply. But they could also be... Grungs. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with grungs. Understand, I don't dislike grungs. You just like gripply more? Yes. Yeah. You could... I, I will also add Kirkba. Yes. For those of you who don't know what Kirkba are... They're squirrel people. And perfectly in line with the Beastlands mentality in terms yes. of societies. Yep. And uh, they, they're they what Heron Gone should have been. Um, <laughs> I'll die on that hill. Deal with it. Uh, <laughs> you could have uh, Planar Druid societies. Sure. 
Perfect not? place for it. You're in the Beastlands. Yep. You could have dinosaur wranglers or dinosaur hunters. They're looking for the ultimate prize. Man. Intelligent Pteranodon. I'm, I'm not. They can have it. Right. And because I'm not going to attempt to train. I just want a Tyrannosaurus and a typewriter. I want to see him type out stuff on his tiny hands on a tiny typewriter. Think about that. That'd be fun. Yeah. You're going to have the feral halflings. And you should. Yeah. They should eat you alive in a stew pot. One thing of consideration also wood or stone elementals. Now, wood elementals would be really cool. Yes. And that's something I think you should just have anyway in this plane. And uh, the, it used to be a thing. I don't think it's a thing anymore. I haven't seen it. But the actual spirit of the land nature elementals. Oh, yeah. So kind of composites of various elementals and stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. Fae groups, of course, we mentioned already. Sure. Throw some fays. And elves. If you, have, if you have to. You could throw some elves. Obviously, right. the buff elves exist already. Well, the thing for me is the elves that are there would have to have come there from outside because if they died to get there, then they wouldn't be elves anymore. They'd They'd be be animals. animals. Yeah, they'd be something else. Let's talk about some of the unique themes that you can find. I would say the first theme would be on the hunt or maybe safari of something. So you're either hunting something or it's hunting you. Sure. That's, I mean, are you on safari or is it? And that is the easiest. I would say that's the second easiest theme to explore. The first easiest theme would be exploration. Just wander yeah. through. We've wound up in the beastlands. Here you go. And the second thing is okay, we've wound up in the beastlands and we're slowly being hunted by something. Everything. <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah. All of the birds are like, he's over here. He's over here, guys. <laughs> It'd be horrible, man. You can explore the theme of primal spirits, like spirits of nature or yeah. spirits of beasts. I I agree. This actually made me think real quick. This would be a great step for the uh, Path of the Beast Barbarian. Oh, to go to the Beastlands and get more in touch with like the- Yes. Yes. Abs- yeah. Guys, start that up. That would be a, what a great way to explore like that character path. Yep. Sure. That'd be fun. Also good for druids. Absolutely. So circle of the moon, circle of the land, and all of them really. Yeah. Spore druids. I mean, there's, there's life in the cavern systems. Yep. And that's another terrain that we didn't really talk much about for the Beastlands, but guess what? Dire cave crickets. Dire cave crickets that are talking to you. Giant, giant, dire cave crickets. That's horrible to consider. Dire roaches. Ugh. Oh. Shape changes of all stripes. That would be kind of fun. Sure. And this is a storyline or theme option to consider. Maybe that's where they came from. It could be. Imagine a group of intelligent animals crossed over to our plane, or to the material plane, and gained the ability to go back and forth. Now, if you are playing from Forgotten Realms, Malar hunting through the Beastlands is a super interesting idea. Because he's an evil god, but he's a god of beasts and hunting. Yes. So, intently... Hunting intelligent petitioners of others' gods is way up his alley. And just because he's a neutral evil god doesn't mean he's not going to be in this plane. Right. What's stopping him? He's a god. Right. And this is the perfect plane to make it. Is he neutral evil or chaotic evil? I believe he's chaotic evil. Chaotic evil. Okay. You could have survival. Just straight up as a theme. Mm-hmm. There you go. <laughs> The majesty of the wild. Just the, I think people realize maybe, maybe on an instinctual level, how dangerous and majestic creatures are. But I think it's a different thing to have to face that concept. 
And finally, you could have the concept of light or shadow, particularly between the various layers, and explore the idea of things that occur at twilight, things that occur at high noon, things that occur at night. And that would be kind of a fun theme to explore just metaphorically. Absolutely. I didn't think about this, but um, you know what a murmuration is? It's where a flock of birds fly together and they do like the, the crazy aerials and all of that as one big group. Yeah. That's really cool in the real world where they're not hunting you. That's a good point. Yeah. They're giving signs. It, why is that murmuration an arrow pointed at me? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, finally, we got a couple of story ideas for you all to kind of think about, get the juices flowing, so to speak. And I think the first one, which Matt, you put together, which is really interesting, is a component quest. Some wizard, druid, whatever, sends you to get an ever-blooming moonflower from Karasuther, the layer of night. Cool. Component quests are always fun. You have to get the blood of an intelligent Gibbon ape in the Beastlands. Sure. Which could be potentially not necessarily a uh, combat encounter. You could literally just say, hey, we need a pint of your blood. Right. And the ape's like, give me something good to eat. Yeah. We have brought you an entire deer and we want a pint of blood. Yeah. <laughs> and that'd be it. Yep. It'd be fun. An ancient forest contains portals to the Beastlands. Those who sleep under its trees come back as beasts. You're in like a logging town or something like that. Kid wanders off, comes back as a squirrel. Yes. That would suck. An intelligent, murderous squirrel. An intelligent, pissed off squirrel. A hunt for a pet. So some noble person or what have you, their pet accidentally went through a portal and you've been hired for an egregious amount of money. To go back and find the pet. To go rescue Lil Fifi. Or it could be your animal companion. Could be. And now it's intelligent and potentially hunting you. This next one was yours, which I'm surprised I didn't even think about it, but it's brilliant. Oh, a group of jungle dwarves regularly enter the Beastlands and ride intelligent dinosaurs as their initiation rite. So it's kind of a rite of passage. They slip through the portal to the Beastlands. They grab the nearest <laughs> Velociraptor. Yeehaw! Just ride that thing. Meanwhile, the Velociraptor is trying to kill them and bitch them out at the same time. Yeah. How dare you ride me? Blah, blah, blah. And the dwarves are like, ah, <laughs> I'm a man now. <laughs> and they slip back through <laughs> the portal. Not for long. <laughs> yeah, not for long. Depends on the velociraptor to get you. A wizard college wants you to negotiate a knowledge exchange with an animal arch wizard. How cool is that? They're intelligent. Some Pi of them are casters. Pygon, the arch squirrel. This would be a squirrel. He would definitely be an invoker. Yeah. 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 Squirrels. A slod or a tenare or devil or, you know, choose something. something else from a particularly evil or potentially chaotic plane is loose in the beastlands and is wrecking havoc. Players must hunt it down before more petitioners are endangered. Yeah, you're literally contacted by an angel or one of those fancy shape changing elves. And they're like, hey, we need you to get rid of this thing. It's, I'm sorry. They're gonna be. They're gonna sound like they're from Jersey Shore for me. Sure. <laughs> this, this is, they've got like a gold chain. They shape shift. A planeswalker society invites the group to start a trade settlement in the Beastlands. Perfect place for trade, right in between two heavens. I mean, yes, but but also no. Maybe they're trying to start trade with the beasts in the Beastland. Now. That would make more sense. Pygon. He needs, he needs components too, you know? Pygon needs his components. How else is he going to cast Fireball on everybody else? Because you know the bats aren't letting him get back guano. Hell no. They're not letting him anywhere near it. Where for my Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Yes. Here's one. A logging company looks to exploit the natural resources of the Beastlands and attempts to hire the morally ambivalent PCs as guards. And attempts is definitely the operant word. Yeah. Because you might not want to do that job. Oh, 
You might not. Yeah. I mean, you know, it sure. happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if you're slick about it and you do one tree at a time, just lop it down, run it straight out the portal. Mm hmm. <laughs> Beast Wars. Beast Wars. Two groups of animal petitioners at war with each other. Beast Wars. Yeah, man. How, how dope is that? I would love for that. You've got to come help. You have to mediate this dispute. The raccoons and the squirrels are, are at it again. I'm thinking like West Side Story, where they just kind of... Kind of yeah. Of, <laughs> just some ridiculous jungle West Side Story that's going on. That would be awesome. Complete with bards. Yes. Absolutely complete with bards. Oh my God, that would be awesome. <laughs> How see this is why I can go. We can go really crazy town with this. We are. I don't know about your singing, but I will not be involved in producing a musical Beast Wars. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Do a little bit of that. Uh, here's one: a necromancer is attempting to raise intelligent undead animal army from the beastlands. Now, this is a great idea, Matt. I have. This is so choice because, first off. You can toss animals in there and they become intelligent. Yes. And as you mentioned, you could compel them to go into the beast lands. Yeah. Then you kill them. Yeah. Then you raise them. Mm-hmm. And now they're intelligent. Mm-hmm. And potentially have class levels. Well, if you're undead as a necromancer or working your way that direction. Yeah. You compel them to start learning. You compel them to pay attention to their lessons. Necromancer, it's not just a profession, it's also a life choice. Indeed. Or death choice, if you were. Sure. So, I would say intelligent undead animal liches, Yeah. first off. Shadows. Oh, yeah, or vampires, perhaps. We got a couple ideas that we decided to throw out for giggles. Baboon whites. Squirrel ghasts. Squirrel ghasts would be great. Shadow ravens. They just kind of fly through you and drain your life. Well, they fly straight through the castle walls. Through you. Through you. They're just like winged with just, I mean, just black as the night with big glowing red eyes. I just, yeah. God, it's awesome. It'd be awesome. Bad days. Bad days. (laughs) We got a couple extras. Party member is dying and must be cured by the unicorn which lives in Maliki's Grove. And Maliki does have a realm in the Beastlands. Yep. Mm-hmm. A wood elemental has gone rogue and is rampaging across brooks. Just tearing <laughs> up. Yeah. Stepped on a nail. Oh. And it's just... Somebody left a fire. <laughs> Smokey the bear came out and told him only you can prevent forest fires and the wood elemental wouldn't have any of it. Smack Smokey in the head, starts rampaging. A Decaton hires the PCs to retrieve a legion of monodrones who have succumbed to the plane and all turned into a colony of ants. Intelligent ants. Now, monodrones and Decatons are Modrons. Right. So imagine this army of Modrons starts stomping through the Beastlands. They all get turned into a colony of ants. Now they're ants. They're still stomping through the Beastlands. And they're still part of the primal hunt. Yes. And if you don't think that's important, look up driver ants. Hmm, good point. And finally, and this is just because this would be perfect for this theme as well. I'm going to make you do it. Captain Planet. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm going to leave. Just Captain Planet. There you go. Okay. So there you have it. A couple of terrain descriptions some of the dangers and hazards, some options for which you can throw in the Beastlands into your story or TTRPG of choice, and of course, Captain Planet for your game. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Any questions or comments? Write to us. Info at goblinscorner.com or you can reach me, Eric at goblinscorner.com or me, Matt at goblinscorner.com We're on all the things. Matt, what are some things we're on? We're on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and Twitch. As Goblin's Corner. Instagram. As the Goblin's Corner. Do you like our show? Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite player, YouTube, and Twitch. If you could do us a favor and click the five stars, give us a review on iTunes, Podchaser, or YouTube. You know, it 
it boosts our show and it puts us in front of more people. And most importantly, it feeds the hungry algorithm, which is hunting us. Yes. It's currently hunting you down. Whether it flies, swims, or crawls, it will find you. The hungry algorithm. Dun, dun, dun. dun. <laughs> Let's be honest. It's a shark. Yeah. That's all the time we have for tonight. Once again, my name's Eric. And I'm Matt. We'll see you next time. Good night, folks. The Goblin's Corner has been written and produced by Eric Holden and Matt Staples. Music by D20. This is a subterranean production.